Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, actually, I prepare my lecture for the future PhD uh, physicist, uh, uh, and I looking looking around. I I see them sitting in the back benches. You should move forward because this is mostly the lecture for you. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm Lukas Tursky, and I'm one of those individuals who will be responsible for running this seminar, this semester at least. And uh, uh, I'm one of those who will be here on this seminar, and I will be the person asking the most nasty questions concerning what is the physics of the issues which we will be discussing here. And uh, so try to, in your, when you will be sitting in my place, try to go to the bottom of the physics of the phenomena which you would like, have to de describe. So I'm, I'm going to talk about today of what physics is all about. And um, uh, the reason why I choose this subject is that uh, Physics is not a branch or a part of a science. Uh, it's not uh, just a science about watching the dials on your MBE machines and trying to keep it in a good shape. And it's also not a science about checking whether the uh, 2077 line in your C++ code which you are preparing to describe some phenomena uh, is properly written, so it will not generate arbitrary results at the end. Physics is actually a viewpoint. It's uh, the only science we now have which amalgamated qualitative and quantitative description of a phenomena and which can be used successfully in describe essentially every fragment of the that endeavor which we now call our civilization. Physics is good to describe the universe as a whole. It is a uh, science or a way of describing phenomena happening in the microscopic world. It is as science which allows us to use here on the earth antimatter in everyday use. And it is also the uh, a science which allows us to understand a social phenomenon. It's also the science which allows us to look at the economical phenomena. So therefore it is not, it should not be considered on the same footing as for example microbiology or the even medieval archaeology, for those sciences have, uh, I mean, they're extremely important and they play essential role in our civilization, but they have a very specific and restricted area of understanding. So let's go on with this slightly philosophical introduction and let's go on and uh, these are two lines of pictures describing two phases of the development of physics. The first line is what I will call an observational physics. A physics uh, which originated when people were trying to understand surrounding nature by doing observations. Occasionally, extremely correct observation. So, I choose as a icon for that period of development of physics three, three pictures of Aristotelian physics, of a Copernicus, and Newton. And essentially, with Newton, this observational part of science has converted itself into another phase. 
Of course, I, I could have chosen very different pictures. For example, I could have used Platon, and instead of Copernicus, Kepler, or maybe Tichon de Brache, uh, the giant of the observation physics. And uh, the Newton, well, it's hard to talk about physics without mentioning Newton. Some people would insert Leibniz. Uh, yeah, but that, yes. we will come to a Leibniz in a moment. You will see why I, Leibniz will appear. But uh, actually, if I have my choice, and if I was talking uh, maybe to a more uh, interested in philosophy or science, uh, auditorium, I will replace Newton by Hooke, because Robert Hooke was a man who not only invented gravity uh, before Newton, uh, but also was this individual, through him, the physics moved from the observation part, the, this what I call observation physics, into an experimental physics, and whoever, drew, whoever now drives a rear wheel driven car is actually still using uh, invention of Robert Hooke. Uh, the, uh, okay. the lower line is a, a line of a transition, a transition from observation physics to the physics based on understanding numbers and describing uh, phenomena in the nature by a certain numbers and trying to build up not observation but experiment. What man, what actually experiment is what we are asking the question to which we not necessarily knew the answer. And again I choose the icons and the first on well, your left, of course, well, yes, is Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin. Why Kelvin? Because a Kelvin, he will appear in our lecture in a moment, but Kelvin is also a man who did something remarkable in physics. He not only was trying to understand the nature, but also was trying to use his knowledge to change the environment. And that is a man who basically invented uh, applied science called thermodynamics, which was a science necessary to build up efficient machines. The dramatic jump in the efficiency of the thermal engines before the invention of a thermal engine after is incredible. The efficiency of the thermal engines before Clausius and I mean I could have used other pictures here but Captain is for some reason iconic to this period. The efficiency was a few percent and then it all of a sudden become a 35 percent and there was even a, a priest in England who invented the engine which had efficiency 70%. And it was so difficult to build that engine that nobody used it until now. Until now. And in some very high quality electric cars nowadays, a part of them is this engine invented in the 19th century. So Calvin was a man, and he also was a man who used at that time, a first field theory existing, electrodynamics, for applied reasons. He was building a telecommunication cables between Europe and United States. Not only calculating, not only inventing in the laboratory, but he spent months and years on the, on the sea, on open sea, on the boats and ships which were lying in the transatlantic so that is why I chose Calvin. 
and the other person to derive this Max Planck. And the Max Planck was the man who had changed completely our civilization by making, <coughs> uh, creating the bridge between the description of a microscopic phenomena and the macroscopic phenomena. And that bridge is a quantity called the Planck constant. It's not the number. Occasionally in the books on you can find that there are some Kabbalistic numbers floating around like a pi or the base of nature logarithm and then somebody writes age. That's a mistake. The Planck constant is a dimension thing. It's not the number. It's a physical property. It's a physical property of the universe which allows us to build up a bridge between what happens on the bottom, as Richard Feynman used to say, and that what happens in the macroscopic world. So that is why I chose Max Planck. And then comes this, again, the icons, Niels Bohr and Erwin Schrödinger. With them, a, a new way of thinking about the physical phenomena, which we now call the quantum mechanics, has come into existence. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, the, it, I mean, the, all the world around us looks differently after discovering quantum mechanics. Because all of a sudden, like the seizure down from Moliere, we, alert, we, we understood that we are talking prose. The word is quantum mechanical. There is no other phenomena in the quantum mechanics. Therefore, I think it's completely idiotic that we don't teach you quantum mechanics in the high schools. We are talking people, we are teaching kids classical physics, and then we are talking that there is something like modern physics, which has a more than a hundred years. And, uh, and that is a quantum mechanics. And sure enough, the quantum mechanics is a difficult um, uh, science by itself, and still we have people, and particularly in these institutions, who are spending their life trying to find out the details and understand the details of quantum mechanics. But there is another view on the quantum mechanics, uh, which I like very much. It's the view of a uh, great Russian physicist, uh, one of the giants of science of the 20th century, Lev Landau, who said that the quantum mechanic is a way of rapid and correct solving problems. <laughs> So we, we, we have this, this quantum mechanics. And sure enough, after that, we have another icon of a change. And that is Albert Einstein. It's impossible to talk about the physics without showing at least one picture of Albert Einstein. Uh, and Einstein is a, like Planck who built up this bridge between the microscopic world and the macroscopic world. The Einstein told us that physics is capable of describing not only the problems of what happens on our laboratory table, but also he was able to tell us and he taught us that we can describe the universe as a whole and invented a science which does it. He also contributed to the quantum mechanics and without him, nothing will actually, will actually happen. And that was this transition period of the experimental physics. And it had generated an incredible breakthrough. The breakthrough it had changed completely our civilization. And what is remarkable, that we are now, as we, are, as we speak, a part of the greatest civilization revolution which is happening since the mankind climbed down from the trees. <laughs> not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, and uh, that came with those three pictures on the bottom. Uh, John Bardeen, who uh, the only physicist ever who got twice the Nobel Prize in physics for and Bretton and Shuttle, three individuals.
individuals who had invented the transistor. This was the end of the 50s of the last century when in the Bell Laboratories a device was built. 40s. What? Well, like 40s. Yeah, well, 40, 50s. Huh? The, 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 this was the 50s. We used to say in the history of 50s. And that was a period of time, that, that was the remarkable discovery. At that time, everybody was building electronic lamps. We were building radios, telephones, and everything. And if you remember, I, I hope you are watching, you have a time uh, also to go to the movies. So you have seen the movie, the gold, the, with, the, with the Clint Eastwood movie uh, about the bench of American soldiers rubbing the gold during the Second War. And there is this remarkable picture of it, Clint Eastwood, who is not the smallest and the weakest individual in the surface of the earth, walking with the cell phone of the time, which is that size. And you see how he is perspiring, trying to carry around this device. Everything was built on the electronic lamps. And all of a sudden, these three individuals have come out with the, uh, well, it wasn't very small at the time, but the completely solid state device, which is called transistor, and said that this can replace the lamps. And there was a huge in multinational company at the time called RCA, which was building radios and everything. And the management said, that's just bullshit. This is not going to work. We have to spend our money still producing lamps and the lamp-based devices. And nobody have, have you ever heard about the RCA nowadays? It's not existing. Many companies have completely collapsed by not understanding that this little device transistor is a device which have changed the civilization. And this is a purely quantum mechanical device. So the revolution in the civilization what makes the cell phone available is a transistor. There are millions of transistors, billions of transistors inside of this of this device. Everything is built on the transistors. In the, the pacemakers in your heart, the, the, the hearing devices, these dumb computers, everything sits on the transistors. So with this, a physics has completely changed its nature. It becomes a creator of a civilization. It stops uh, just describing the nature. It's building an environment. And I think it's the... It is, I will defend the statement that what we now call natural environment around us is completely artificial. It's built by us during the last 60 years. There is nothing surrounding us, no. Right? And if you dig deeply, you find out that everywhere, somewhere, there was a transistor involved. If you go to a doctor nowadays, Whatever he does with you, it's, a, it's, it's based on the equipment, which are quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanics has changed. And I'm showing on this two other individuals, at this one individual, it's the Count Marconi, oh. a man who had built up a radio. Because this was a follow-up of what Kelvin was doing. And all of the science, the science of field theory, this remarkable invention or discovery, or how should I call it, by Maxwell in the mid of the 19th century, is another pillar on which our civilization is now hanging. Without the Maxwell equations, we will not be around. We will be, there will be no civilization. There will be nothing to study, basically, nowadays. And the, the, everything will be dark and dumb and something. And therefore, I also 
have shown a cell phone. Because a cell phone is the a device which came to into existence in the November 2001 when the Stephen Jobs have shown a first truly mobile operating internet device which was called iPod. And that was the period. So it was 2001. This, this is anniversary which has been overshadowed by a disaster of a 9-11. But uh, this is the moment when the history of the world has changed. With this, this day, a civilization moved to the internet. We changed the geometry of the human interaction from the geometry related to the surface of the globe to the uh, Romanian geometry of a sphere to the uh, geometry of a network. Our friends on the Facebooks are no longer the friends or enemies like in the Shinkiewicz uh, books, like Zhenjian, uh, friends with whom he had a quarrel about the pears falling on his field. Uh, and uh, it is uh, our neighbors are neighbors in the network world, not in the not in the in the physical world. Uh, who was but, the, who was the third person in the previous slide? Shockley. No, I mean this one at the Marconi. 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 An individual. Please excuse me. I'm 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 going to get there. Yes. There was a Bart Ratti and Shuckley. There's three ah, guys who got the Nobel Prize for Wesley Brat. And Ratti and And of course, right after this tremendous breakthrough, breakthrough in physics, there was another breakthrough. The breakthrough in which has been writing the crest of the, this wave of changes introduced by physics, and that was the this discovery of DNA. And these are these three gentlemen who are responsible, or the, whom history assign this result, but that's not true, as we will see in a moment. And there is a, the reason why I'm showing is that the physics has changed, but it was changing slowly in some sense. And the process via which the physics was changing until the discovery of a transistor was a, something which uh, philosophers called a scientific revolution. And this is a proper time to show you a few lines of a history of a, what is called the theory of science. Because the philosophers were completely shocked by the fact that it is possible to describe the world using mathematical equations, laboratory equipments, and the idea based on that, without this profound thinking and uh, considering uh, complicated structures of which are basically a mumbo jumbo based on the uh, syllogism. And uh, there is a branch of science called the theory of science. And uh, I'd like just to mention, because we don't have a time, but you will be passing an uh, exam in the philosophy for your PhD. And I insist, you request from those who are teaching your philosophy, that they eventually stop talking about the mumbo jumbo of Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, uh, Bruno Latour, and all those uh, not understanding quadratic equations 
philosophers, so famous French philosophers, but try to, un to, to read the, a really decent uh, philosophy. And it starts with Immanuel Kant. And uh, it, who, who was this giant who said that the science is the way to develop and build up a, our civilization? And immediately it was questioned. And one of the philosophers who questioned it, who claimed that the development of physics is responsible for the collapse of the civilization during the First War, was Oswald Spengler. And it is remarkable that just a few weeks ago, uh, a very important Polish politician, uh, Andrzej Zybertowicz, wrote a story which is a, essentially the ideas of Spengler repeated and, uh, well, that's another topic. And uh, the theory of science was sort of formal, formalized by a very famous uh, philosopher, Karl Popper, and, uh, and also by a, a, a the founding father of a family of distinguished scientists, Michael Polan. And that was very much philosophical way of formulating a science, what a science is all about, and so forth. And fortunately, for physics was not based on those ideas described by this philosopher. Physics has its own philosophy of science. The philosophy which is, uh, the, these are pictures of those. The philosophy which is based on a very simple and one sentence. The sentence, it is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. And that is a statement from which we owe to this gentleman, William Kingdon. Clifford. Those of you who will be studying mathematics will be learning about the Clifford algebra. He was a uh, 19th century, uh, the second part of the second half of 19th century scientist in England. He actually was the first man who wrote that the gravity is a geometrical phenomenon. He, he didn't have a tools. He actually is a man who translated the Riemann <coughs> habilitation thesis into English and the first printed version of a Riemann habilitation is in the test translation of, of, of Clifford. Riemann habilitation has never been published. He will never get the points from the, uh, our Minister of Science for anything. Riemann was not existing. He had not contributed to the science. He had not published in physical review letters. He had not published anything in nature. He even probably never heard about the journal of nature. Anyway, this is a William Clifford. And this is a fundamental book, the little book which is called The Common Sense of Exact Sciences. Uh, and if you don't want to read it, because it's difficult to read, because it's old-fashioned English, you may read something similar. There was a Polish mathematician in Lwów, Jakub Gronowski, who left in the 30s for England. And he became not only a great mathematician for inventing something which is called the theory of shapes, but in two years after he emigrated from Poland, he became editor of a British journal devoted to the poetry of William Blake, famous British romantic uh, poet. And uh, he wrote a series of remarkable philosophical books. And one of those books of Jacob Gronowski is actually an explanation of a Clifford uh, which is called the common sense of science. Jakub Pronowski, you can also 
use your computer to search the YouTube archives to find out a complete edition of a first ever uh, serial, scientific serial produced by BBC in the 50s, which is called The Ancient of Man. And that is, uh, if you look at now, nowadays, on how the Attenborough is showing his remarkable films and other people preparing a, a, a programs for television, that is a, a form which has been invented by Jakob Brunos. So the Clifford is a very simple statement, is what is nowadays called in the philosophy of science uh, uh, a Clifford's truth theory. I mean, philosophers have long, lengthy discussion about what is truth, and how, what is true, and what is not. And he is the fan. And it is remarkable that the Clifford was basically repeating what was uh, what is called in the history of science a Jeffersonian project. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, the only scientist who has ever been a president of the United States, even on the day of his when he was accepting president's office, he also did three times in the morning, at noon, and the evening, the basic, at that time, experiments. He measured the temperature, humidity, and the pressure, and wrote them in his, that day, when he was in the President of the United States, in his diary, at that time, people wrote the diary. There are only three informations, these numbers, which he measured. And uh, Thomas Jefferson is the creator of what is called the Jeffersonian project, how, the, how we should build up a, a society. And that is also based on the fact that only the science, and the science is based on evidence. And um, so what is this evidence? What actually we should understand as an evidence in order to apply the King Clifford views? And that is, uh, what we own to Lord Kelvin. And this is the famous Kelvin statement. When you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. When you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of a knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science. And that was why I show you the Kelvin, because I think this is a remarkable statement. And that is what is said uh, why physics has succeeded. Because in physics, in physics we have this simple evidence provided by the experiment. When we, pro when we advance some theory, when we have some views, and if we cannot measure its outcome, if we cannot make experiments, and if those experiments cannot be repeated by others and verified, then we don't know anything. It's just the... Okay. Uh, and with this, at the end of the 19th century, this view of Kelvin, that we have to do some measurements, and out of these measurements, using them as evidence, build up a theory which has a deep consequences for development of a civilization, has been developed by many, many individuals in science. But I do believe <coughs> that the most important is what has been done by the Maria Skłodowska Curie. As you know, I mean, uh, we have seen now even the movies by Maria about her life. My 
colleague and friend, Elzbieta uh, Sikora, one of the most greatest uh, composers of modern music. She wrote an opera about the Maria Skłodowska Curie with a completely idiotic libretto. And, uh, but the music is great. Why I'm picking up a Maria Skłodowska Curie? Uh, we, we have this story that essentially single-handed she had shuffled uh, tons of the sludge from the Yakimov mines in, and discovered two isotopes, radium and polonium. And the polonium is so important because it's even used by spies to kill other spies and so on. But uh, mm -hmm. this, this, that is irrelevant from my viewpoint. Uh, if you will ever have a time and read a Nobel Prize lecture by Pierre Curie, her husband, or if you will read the paper in which the radium radioactivity is described by Henri Becquerel, Pierre Curie, and Maria Skodowska Curie, you will find a one sentence which is unique in scientific writing of a history. There is a, these two male authors write. And now the following passage is solely due to Maria. Skłodowska Curie. And there are a few lines which have, as far as I'm concerned, have changed the physics. This is, these lines are that Maria Skłodowska Curie writes that the radioactive decay is a statistical process. It was the first time in history when the statistics, probabilistic idea was applied to the single object. Before Maxwell and Art Boltzmann and others, they used a statistic to describe the properties of the samples of many, many identical objects. And that was a property of the different behavior, average property of a different behavior of a thousands of billions of billions of billions of gas particles in this room or whatever. No, for Maria Skłodowska Curie, a probabilistic phenomenon was that something happening to the one atom, to the nuclei of the one element, which is decaying in the sun. And in some sense, this was the same probabilistic idea which emerged later in the quantum mechanics in the Bohr uh, uh, interpretation of a quantum mechanics. So I think for just this idea, which she deducted from experiments, she came to this conclusion by watching these samples of radium decaying in, his, in her laboratory, that she, from these observations and experiments, repeated experiments on decay of the radium uh, uh, nuclei, we got the Nobel Prize for the for radium. Uh, that is that is I think is remarkable. And as a second example, I would like to use <coughs> Rosalind Franklin. <coughs> Rosalind Franklin was a, a lady who has done a first thorough X-ray experiment of a biological sample. And she had discovered DNA structure. And her results were without her agreement and without her knowledge, behind her back, used by the Crick and Watson and Wilkins to publish a paper on DNA and double helix for which they are uh, the world. No, we, we can't do anything about the Franklin because she died very essentially simultaneously with this Nobel Prize. So we cannot repeat, we cannot do something like with was done with Jocelyn Bell, who discovered pulsars and was also cheated by her PhD advisor. So watch your PhD advisors. <laughs> and and uh, um, Strickland was not. What? Donna Strickland yes. was awarded. 
the Asti. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. So Rosalind Franklin was also the, she shows that she can deduct something from experiment. She could have done the experiment. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me show you the examples of this. And now I'd like to show you a, a certain difference between the changes which had happened in physics and in other areas of science. We have a Copernicus revolution, we had a quantum mechanics, and we have a relativity theory. And each of these pieces of science, it was a, a piecewise change. We had a classical optics, we have a thermodynamics, then there was a fixing of the of the laws of black body radiation by Planck by discovering this bridge between microscopic and microscopic physics. And eventually there was a quantum mechanics by Schrodinger and others. In Copernicus revolution, there was a Ptolemaic observation, extremely precise, providing a decent numbers for applications. But there was another idea and slowly by Kepler, by Tycho de Brahe observations, and the Kepler mathematics skill that has developed in a new way. And the relativity theory was uh, uh, less similar because it was a rapid change. Everything was completely different in relativistic, special theory of relativity than in the Galileo theory of relativity. So, but basically physics developed by something which was called a revolution, or by, that, by Thomas Kuhn, who had written 58 years ago, he had written a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. He invented the idea of a paradigm shift. That we have a part, that we have a mosaic of ideas, and some of them change slowly, slowly, and all of a sudden, this mosaic is already completely different than it was before. But what happens with the transistor discovery, and with this change of civilization in the at the beginning of the 21st century, was something very different. It was something which in a completely different branch of science, in the social science, is called creative destruction. And the creative destruction was first described by Karl Marx in his book. And in the, by, it was codified by Werner Schrödinger Zom, Zom, Zomberg. But it actually, the notion comes from Joseph Schumpeter, who was economist. And, uh, and the first creative destruction in science was a Crick and Watson, and of course, based on the experiments by Franklin. But that was a change where there was no slowly changing mosaic of views which adapted to the new experiment. It was a complete collapse. The biology was completely different after the DNA, double helix, than it was before. It was destroyed, but that was not the destruction of the barbarians coming to Rome, but that was a creative destruction, because immediately with this, a new system came to exist of the idea. And, uh, the branch of science which benefit from it is a medicine. And this is a book by uh, Eric Topol. Eric Topol is a distinguished American cardiologist who in 2004 published a paper uh, in which he shown that the, produced by the company Merck's uh, drug called Vioxx, blood pressure, 
is actually killing people. As a result, my, uh, the Mercs, who, which, who, the company Mercs, which had the, his interest, financial interest at the clinic at the University of Cleveland in this famous hospital, fired Topol. Nothing happened to him. He is the head of the Salk Institute in La Jolla nowadays. And this is the famous book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And the medicine is actually a branch of science which has can undergo during the last few years, basically because of physics, a creative destruction, and is completely different than it was 20 or 50 years ago. And an example of it is what I would like to show you is this device. When we speak about thousands of people in Poland, there are, in Poland there are 12, I mean I counted 12 PET machines. Positron emission tomography. These are scanners which use antimatter. The antimatter which we produce in the cyclotrons. The antimatter does not exist around us in the, in the universe except of a small junks in the cosmic radiation which are coming. There is no antimatter. We are using, due to the development of physics, we were able to generate an unexisting in the, our part of the universe substance which we harness for benefit of humans for curing people. So this is remarkable that there is only one activity, human activity, which uses this antimatter and I think it's this remarkable proof of the fact that the science should develop with the creative destruction and also that the, that the physics is something which allows us to build up a cell phone and also cure people. Okay, and to close, I have the following sentence of what happened. But my battery in my mouse is probably dying. But you should. Well, anyway, so let me read this sentence, okay? For some reason. It's the Albert Einstein sentence. Whoever undertakes himself to set himself as a judge of truth and knowledge, is shipwrecked by the lotter of gods. Don't do the philosophy of science. Clifford has done it. There's no need for any philosophical discussion. Be discussing things without the sufficient evidence which is provided by experiments and describing numbers, it is no point of wasting your time. It's better go and take a bike ride. Thank you very much. <laughs>